So today I'm going to do uh, just covering packet captures from LTE, and I've been able to add the 5G work we've been doing in T-Mobile. So I've got some of those uh, captures at the end as well. And for you, those of you who don't know me, I have been in wireless for um, over 20 years now. Started with CDMA and worked for various vendors. And that's about all I need. So today we're gonna to talk about packet captures in the core of LTE. Now this over here, we're to the left side, that is the RAN, we're talking about the ENOB. That's where the user equipment connects to and that's the, the radio out in the, uh, on the sides of the roads and light poles and everything that you're used to seeing. But what I handle is the equipment that those cell sites connect back to. And that's at the enhanced packet core box we have here. And my packet captures are concentrated on the MME and the SMP gateway. Um, protocols we're gonna cover, we have SCTP, session control transmission protocol. It's a layer three protocol, much like TCP and UDP. Then we have diameter, GDP, S1AP, which connects out to our cell sites. And then at the end, I'll go over the changes that we're seeing in 5G. First off, SCTP, uh, Session Control Transmission Protocol. Um, much like TCP, where you have segments or UDP, you have datagrams, SCTP is referred to as chunks. Chunks carry the user data or the control data for SCTP itself. And multiple chunks can be handled within the SCTP packet, except for when we're first setting up the connection. When we talk about two sides of the SCTP stream, we're referring to that as the endpoints. Um, so we can have multi-homed or, or single-homed asynchronous wise, and then, well, like I said before, SCTP uses streams as the uh, channel for transporting the messages. And the stream is referred to as unidirectional. So you're gonna have one stream towards the cell site and one stream back towards the core. The SCTP establishment is over a four-way handshake. We have the init, the initac, cookie echo, and cookie act. So when these, uh, when this presentation is posted after the session, you, this uh, capture is embedded in here. You'll be able to see um, within Wireshark how SCTP uh, stands up connection, and then I also have the shutdown, which is a three-way handshake. We'll go over what that looks like. So like I said, the first message here is the init. I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but it's highlighted in the green packet. This is just a single cell site talking back to the core, saying that it wants to start an establishment. Now, the MME, which is the first side of the core, will respond back to the ENOB or the cell site with an init act. Within that packet, we are able to tell the cell site or the ENOB that we have two paths available to get to us. So this is how we establish redundancy with just a single peer request from the cell site. So this 9.00.9, obviously not a real IP, but this is what the cell site is expecting to talk to. And then the MME will respond and say, hey, I also have this other path. Now we do this, it's the same MME, but intentionally it is routing over a different geographical location. So for example, if we were in um, Austin, this path here would be through Dallas and this path here could be through Houston. Um, that's just how we handle, how, how you can set up redundancy by using a single request. After that, you'll see the secondary side start initiating heartbeats. Cover heartbeats in a second. 
but that's all that's required is the four-way handshake to set up. The secondary will start as heartbeats, and then the primary will come in with its heartbeats after the establishment. When we talk about acknowledgements in SCTP, every acknowledgement is, is actually a SAC, a selective acknowledgement. Um, it carries all the transmission sequence numbers. So every packet that is sent has a sequence number. It is responded to as an ACK with that sequence number. And unlike TCP, it's sequential, meaning it doesn't account for the total number of bytes in the payload or anything like that. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so on. So when we act, we're simply going to act one. And then we talk about a cumulative TSN act. So we can send an act for 10, and that will encompass every TSN transmitted. That's one through 10. If we don't have one through 10, and we have some, something like one, two, five, six, nine, and 10, we then have the ability, what we call gap blocks. So you do the cumulative act, and then you the SCTP protocol will then attach gaps on the end of the header and show that the sending end needs to resend the missing packets. And I'll show that here in a second. Uh, path monitoring built into SCTP. We, we don't have to do anything on the application layer. This is the heartbeat chunks. Heartbeats are one on their own. It's much like BGP or where we can send so many heartbeats and program it after so many heartbeats are lost, then we tear the peer down thinking it's dead. And that is done with an abort. So for an example, if we don't see three heartbeats acknowledged, then the enemy will initiate that path to go down and try to bring it up someplace else. So talking about the um, gap blocks, so we have the cumulative TSN. So like I said, if you had 10 here, you would be uh, acknowledging one through 10. Um, but if your gap block here said uh, acknowledging 12, that would mean that you're missing TSN 11. And I'll show you what that looks like here. So right here, we have a cumulative TSN and then in 591. And then we have a gap block starting on 595, and it's acknowledging 5 through 597. So this right here is acknowledging three packets. You can discern from this packet right here that we have missed 592, 593, and 594. So I would expect to see that retransmitted in the packet capture somewhere further down. Uh, this capture is also embedded in the PowerPoint, so when it's posted, you'll be able to bring it up and look at that example. Um, going back to how we stand up the stream, after the four-way handshake, right here is the init, ninac, cookie echo, cookie ack. Then we have to do the application layer on top of that because the the ENOB or cell site doesn't speak directly SCTP. It has to have some application data on top of that. And that application data is referred to as S1AP. So S1 is actually the interface name going from the ENOB back to the MME. So after the setup of SCTP, the ENOB will send an S1 setup request. In this request, it has a lot of good information like the ENOB ID, the name, it's a human readable name that we'll bring back into a database that we use for auditing. Um, supported TAs, that means tracking areas. So it's how we group logically ENOBs into a particular area. And then uh, DRX or paging DRX, that's just telling us what slot uh, we're able to send requests out to be able to wake up mobiles. So Wireshark has a lot of good tools for TCP. They have just a few for SCTP. Um, it's usually around just looking at what stream IDs there are and if there's any gaps, gap block counts. 
So I like to set up a particular profile just for SCTP. And this is the few things that I, that I make sure I add. I create a button that removes heartbeat and heartbeat acts because I'm not really concerned about heartbeats unless I see an abort. An abort, you're gonna color code red and you're gonna notice that right off the bat. So then you can unclick your button for heartbeat, add them back in and you're gonna show the heartbeats were lost. Another thing I like to do is add a column that shows the stream, that shows the gap count. So you know instantly that this selective acknowledgement actually contains gaps. So that's where packet loss has started. And also the TSN. So again, TSNs are sequential, 88, 89, and so on. Um, also, I show a coloring rule for fragments. While may not be in great importance when you're talking about um, gaps or you're talking about S1 init, um, S1 setup, fragments can be a problem. So when we talk about gaps, unlike TCP, where you can only have three selective acknowledgments, and then the, at that point, you're really at a stall per se, gaps can be added up into the max segment size. So if that max segment size is large, then you can have a dozen gaps in there. But if your segment size is small, then, or MTU, I'm sorry, is small, then you're not gonna have many gaps at all. And you may start to fragment. And we'd rather see SCTP, I'd rather see, <clears throat> sorry, IP fragments than SCTP layer fragments. And then I always, just out of habit, have made a color rule when I start up here. So that's way I know where the start of a session belongs or is. That wraps up for SCTP and S1AP. Next protocol is uh, diameter. We use uh, diameter for authentication, authorization, accounting, policy control, and just various other key exchanges that occur. And that's what this HSS is referring to. So when you set up a call, <clears throat> not when you set up a call, when you attach to our network, um, your device will have a shared set of keys. <clears throat> that shared set of keys is within the, this HSS <clears throat> and that is transferred over. That as long as the keys match, we allow you on the network. If we don't, then you are rejected at that point. I had RFC just because that's always interesting and kind of where diameter came from. Diameter was kind of born out of radius. And since they didn't have a good name for the next generation of protocols, they just took the double of radius and made it diameter. So when we talk about diameter, um, usually referred to as a state machine. And it's six steps to get set up. Three, the first three part of this state machine really relies on SIN, SYNAC, and ACK. So if you're in a router or in the EPC, you may show the peer, show diameter peer, and you'll see these states. If you see this state, you'll know it's sent the SIN waiting on the SYNAC and it's just progressing through the state machine. Once the three-way handshake is done in TCP, now we're able to send payload data. In that payload data, we send a capabilities exchange that simply says, my node is able to do authentication. And the receiving node acts that, then digests it and sends back the answer and says, I can do authentication too, let's talk. So again, PCAP is embedded into the PowerPoint. You'll be able to see what I'm talking about here once it's posted. Unless you have any questions now. Just going through the 
that the header information as we talk about a capabilities exchange, it's simply a command code that says this is an exchange. And within the answer, you get application codes that apply to what application you're going to be talking on. So like I know that S6A is authentication, GX is policy, and so on and so on. Now, after you get through capabilities exchange, here we are uh, as code 27, that should be 257. You can, uh, we also have watchdog, same with heartbeats, that's on SCTP. Diameter will send keep alive as well. They're called watchdogs and you'll see those as code 280. Wireshark does this all for you. Once it sees 280, it makes this command code read watchdog. Same with abort and all these other examples here. So if you're just looking at the header information, you would just see 257. But with Wireshark, we can make this human readable. And now you don't have to worry about knowing what 257 is. It tells you that it's a capability exchange. Now, if you don't like what that says, we can change that. Diameter is made up of AVPs, that's attribute value pairs. So if you're familiar with JSON, it's the same as a key value. That's all we're sending is a key and a value. You have a code command as a key and the value in the previous example was 257. So that's how we exchange capabilities. That's how we do error notifications and so on and so on. Before I get into changing AVPs, I just want to lay out that. So the AVPs themselves, unlike JSON, don't have commas per se or very good delimiters, but it is all in ASCII. So if you don't want to dig through your key value pairs, open up your bit view, look at the ASCII side, and you can simply click on the ASCII portion that you're wanting to look at. When you click on it, it will open the AVP for you. So now you don't have to open this, go on and drill and drill down, drill down, drill down some more. If you know what you're looking for in ASCII presentation, all you have to do is click on it there. Now, back to how AVPs are represented. So like I said, 257 was represented as um, uh, was it? CER, Capabilities Exchange. So all that information is not actually within a dissector. The dissector calls a series of XML files. You will find these files in your Wireshark home diameter directory. And you actually can go in, find the information of to let's say this code 3001 and change it if you don't like it. Now these were developed out of specs. So we know that 3001 equals diameter command unsupported. So that was grabbed from the spec. And when you open this file, it will tell you that as well. It will tell you which spec it got that information from. For example, if radius AVPs, it tells you, it shows you the websites and gives you the radius attributes one through five, that's in the comment section of XML. You open up that website, you see it right there. So this is pretty much word, from word, word for word from the spec. But also the reason I show this is let's say you see that in a, in a PCAP and you're not familiar with what that code does. If you open the XML file, it will tell you what spec it got that information from. Most of the times include the link to that spec. You can open it and read that for yourself and you know, continue reading what that error code is, is used specifically for. So again, TCPs, 
got a lot of good tools in, in Wireshark. Diameter is fairly limited. Um, you kind of rely on yourself to build your own views and your own type of graphs if you, if you want any from IOGraph. Um, one thing I do is custom columns. So I will build um, color codes specifically for a diameter error or specific type of diameter error. And then I will use that color code name as a reference in my columns. So maybe I have a specific error that it means something else to me. I can look at that using the color rule name and use the color rule name as a, a column. And that, that seems to help me quite a bit. The other things, if you don't know, um, you can use or in column names. So you can have diameter error or something else, and that will give you the output of the column. It seemed to be out of order there, but on diameter profile, again, I was showing you this. I, the diameter XML is the main file. Uh, responsible for calling all the other specific files. So like I was showing you in the slide before that you can change the meaning of code 266 to, uh, I'm sorry, code 1001. This is diameter multi-round auth. So you could change that to be whatever you want. Don't suggest that, but I just wanted to show you that the dictionary XML is what is called by the actual dissector. And then when you look at dictionary XML, it actually calls all the other XML files that are in that directory. Um, so if you weren't interested in some of the things that like the Oracle XML was dissecting and maybe it was overriding your custom or, or something to that effect, you could delete it out of the dictionary XML file. How that's set up. So again, AVP is you're mapping a code to a name. Okay. We tell the this code what type of it it is. So it's an aux string or and in, in one example, we were saying 0, 1, 2, 3. So they were actual codes. So like CER code 257. You would see code 257 right here. And that would equal capabilities exchange. So we know when we see code 106, the name we're going to give it is the event trigger. OK? But what is the value? So this is the key. What is the value? The value is going to be one, two, three, four, or five. Now that doesn't make much sense. So we map zero to SGSN change. So now when you look at Wireshark, you will see event trigger SGSN change instead of 106 equals zero. Hope that makes sense. If it wasn't a a, a value, then would be an aux string, and you would see the value of code 105 being that ASCII character that I laid out before. So in this example, rule name, charging rule name would be the value, the actual value that came across in ASCII. Also, when you have JSON, you have the value of the object is another object. And the value of that object could be an array. And then the key and then the values in that array. So there's the same concept here with diameter. The value of the attribute could be another attribute. So how do we group those? The XML file does the same thing, except it's called GAVP, so group AVP. So we have a charging rule install. 
when we receive code 101, it's a charging rule install. And then underneath that, we would see this group charging, let's say in this example, we're gonna use charging rule base name. Okay, so now we go back, we go down to AVP name, charging rule base name, and then use the value that it's using. So charging rule install would be equal to charging rule base name, look at that AVP, and the value is what is in the ASCII text. So you can see it here, charging rule install becomes charging rule base name becomes IMS default. So if you ever looked at how these arrows open up or open the subtrees, that's how that's done within this in the XML file. So that wraps up U, uh, diameter. Now we're looking at GDP. GDP is a tunneling based protocol. It's over UDP. It's used in all three GPP standards. So GSM, UMTS, and LTE. It is used to encapsulate data as it's coming from the cell site ENOB going through the core network. In LTE, there was a version two added that carries our control plane information. I'll show you how that works here in a second. And just laying out the interfaces in which GDP U or GDP C is seen. So GDP V2 version two, or what we refer to as GDP C for control are used to manage the tunnel traffic traffic for GDP. So it in itself does not have any tunnel information. It simply carries the control plane information, meaning what TEIDs, which is how GDP handles its endpoints and different information that's needed to set up the call. GDP one, version one, which is legacy GDP, is simply that. It rides on top of UDP, has an endpoint identifier, so that when a message comes from the ENOB towards the core, the core knows what this message is for, untunnels it, does what it needs to with this tunneled information. This in itself is SIP. So that would just be IP routed to whatever its destination is. Okay. So while GDP is stateless, um, meaning it rides over UDP, so it really doesn't know that it's lost a packet. It just receives a packet, untunnels it, tunnels it back up, sends it on, or maybe doesn't tunnel it back on and so sends it on. But Wireshark allows us to dig into the upper layer protocols. So we can see TCP over GDP B1. And this is the best advantages you're going to have when troubleshooting something on the user plane. So many times a week, I will have to take a capture at the serving gateway and the, and the PDN gateway. And you'll see the packet coming in the S gateway, going out, arriving at the P gateway, then going out. So in this example, you see how we have three copies, one coming in the gateway, one going out of the gateway, then one going to the internet. So you can see here, the protocol no longer says GDP. That's where we stripped off the GDP header and sent it to the internet. So this is an example of the send, send, act, act. I'll see three going out, three coming back, three acknowledged. So that's great that we are able to diagnose, you know, use TCP in order to chase packet loss. But one of the problems is we can't take advantage of Wireshark's feature when troubleshooting TCP because it sees this as a do back or retransmit.
So one thing we need to do is remove the dupe axe. Edit cap can remove dupe blitz. It's the command you could use. If you see it within you know, 0.00 seconds, you're going to send it to another file. We're only gonna keep one copy. We have it across multiple peers. We can use T Shark with this command. Let's simply say remove duplicates. Another way we can do it, which I don't have in here anymore, is just put in a um, filter on Wireshark and say no GDP, not GDP. That would then remove all the GDP packets that had GDP headers on it and just leave you with the unencapsulated packets going to the internet. At that point, you just export those packets to a new PCAP, open that new PCAP, and you're going to have good ECP diagnosis information or analyzation information that Wireshark does for you. One other problem we continue to run into is with LTE, we have a lot of information. We can go up to 100 meg a second. That's going to be a large PCAP. So sometimes we're not, oh, a lot of times we're not inter interested in the, in the payload data. We just want to see the TCP and then cut off HTTP at that point. So this example, I'm just is saying the Super Bowl where I was troubleshooting something with Super Bowl and that's a lot of information. I sliced it at the 128th bit. That way I was able to reduce my capture size. Wireshark loaded a lot faster and was able to do the TCP analysis a lot quicker. Now, the good thing about this is that you still have the original PCAP. So in this one right here, underscore 128, if you find where the, the, the packet packets are missing and you're interested in the HTTP flow at that point, then you can go back to your original and look at that. The other thing is if you want to keep the HTTP information, but want smaller files, we can split it up. Let's say number right here, minus C, number of packets per file, and then it'll split that one large PCAP into however many files it needs to with, let's say I, I chose, you know, 10,000 packets per file and split that up 10,000 packets at a time. It's also pretty useful. As we talk about deduping, um, the other thing to be aware of is that a packet can come into an interface and not exit the interface. So we come into the S gateway, leave the S gateway, go into the P gateway, leave the P gateway. So if we're tapped correctly, we should see the packet four times. So before deduping the packets, just make sure you see the packets four times. With T Shark, let's come in right here. I know that this is just representing the file. So read the file. The fields that I wanna see is a sequence number. So all I'm doing is outputting the sequence number. I sort just because I don't want them to be out of order. I don't necessarily cared about out of order, but if I don't order them, then the unique mechanism will mess up a bit. So I sort them and then I do a unique with a count. So now I know all these have four. Once I get down to here, I was like, okay, so now I only have one. So I know this either went to the S gateway or P gateway and never exited. So instead of deduping and, and slicing and everything, I can go right to this and say, okay, just set a filter and look for that sequence number five, seven and see what happened. Okay, so that wraps up GDP. I'm gonna talk about IMS and Volte for a second. Uh, when we talk about Volte, it's really nothing more than what we've used for VoIP over the years, except for putting it over LTE and we're treating it with some guaranteed bare 
DHCP value, values that are more favorable for the packet to make it to the endpoint than any other packets. So when we talk about Volti, most of the tools you have for SIP in Wireshark will work. And Wireshark doesn't care if it was VoIP or Volti, it's just voice over IP at that point. Um, so with voice over IP, you have two protocols. You have SIP, SIP, Session Initiated Protocol, which handles the signaling part of the call. And then you have RTP, real-time protocol, which handles the voice. So voice going up and down, it's over UDP, because uh, you don't care, you, you care if it gets there or not, but if it doesn't get there, you don't want to repeat it because you know somebody's already talked and that moment has passed. So we're over UDP. Um, also, when we talk about voice over IP or at Volti, it's good to know timers and parameters that are associated with, with how RTP is supposed to flow. So built into Wireshark, there's an RTP stream analysis. And this stream analysis shows you, just in this one, the packet time difference. So down here, we see that each packet is arriving 20 milliseconds right after the other. And then all of a sudden, it went up to 160 milliseconds. And back to, down to 20, back up to 60. So in this case, I know that my timers are, if I'm talking, like I'm talking now, a packet will be sent 20 milliseconds apart. So the way this, the application works, and you just think of VoIP as an application, it's going to take 20 milliseconds of data, then send it. I don't care how much information is on there. I'm just going to send that data every 20 milliseconds. Now, if you're not talking, let's say you're the one listening, I don't need to take up that bandwidth every 20 milliseconds. If I don't hear anything, the application will only send a packet every 160. Now, why? It's because the TAS, the IMS server, needs to know that both sides of the conversation is there. It needs to know both people are still there. We haven't lost one side for, an, for some other reason. So, um, these timers are pretty well set across carriers, across VoIP. If you were to capture on your own uh, VoIP service, you would see tw 20 milliseconds and 160 milliseconds as well. So Wireshark's pretty good at showing you something like this. The problem I have is that it only shows you one side at a time. I want to see what both sides are doing within the same graph. So I use IO graph and I, I use that quite a bit, used it over the years, just kind of got used to it. Probably more better things out there, but that's just what I choose to use. So in this capture, I use a tool to find RTP streams in the capture. So you can go to telephony, RTP, RTP streams. So now you've, there's usually more than two in here because you're dealing with a large capture and you're just finding the stream that you're interested, click find reverse and create your filter. So then this big long filter is created, but at least you have both sides of the conversation, the caller and the callee. Okay. So once we go to that, I can open an IO graph and use a line built for the caller. We're using UDP time underscore delta, which gives us the same information as the previous analysis was showing. So you were just looking at one side of the conversation. It's going to look the exactly the same as the previous graph. But now we're going to add the receiver. So in this example here, we had the caller. And we're used to seeing the 20 milliseconds and the 160 milliseconds, and we had the receiver. So using this, I can tell you who was talking and who was listening. They then, you know, start talking here. And then the blue became the listener. And the conversation goes back and forth. So this looks great. 20 milliseconds, 160. But this graph over here looks a little bit different. 
these are two different issues. This is good, this is bad. I just want to give you an example. So I see the 20 milliseconds for the red line and I see it go up to 160. That's good. But on the blue line, that never really gets down to 20 and 160 is all jagged. So it, the line instead of 20 milliseconds here seems to be 40 milliseconds. So I think to me, this is what's beneficial about being able to see both sides of the, the call on one graph. And that's why I choose to use IO graph. So what do I discern from this? I go back to the packets. I change my time to be Delta and I can see that, hey, this, the, the blue line from before is sending a packet at 40 seconds and then immediately sending another one. And it's consistent at four sec 40 seconds and consistently sending two packets at a time instead of doing the 20 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds. So then we go back to the ENOB or the BT, uh, cell site at this point and say, what's happening? So we can see that on the cell side as well. Come to find out the radio uplink is only allowing packets on the 40 millisecond mark. And what's happening is the device is buffering this one packet, waiting for that schedule to come around and sending both at the same time. So this introduces uh, you know, some pain points, definitely introduces some jitter. And that's how I use Wireshark to figure that out. So that wraps up LTE and a little bit of Volte there. On, on the space, as we're doing more and more 5G, um, the, the, the presentation so far has just been concentrated on the core, which looks like this. We pretty much have five elements, a few interfaces, and then when we move to 5G, my core now looks like this, what's in the blue. So I go from five nodes to, and I, not every node is even here, so I go to nearly a dozen nodes. So the functions like authorization, like the AAA, you have three functions there or three service, authentication, counting, and authorization. In 5G, that's actually split up into three different nodes now. So services become their own nodes. And this is more of a cloud thinking that I'm just going to spin up a new server and use that server specifically for a particular service. Um, it's just a definition of what those nodes were. I showed on the previous slide, if you're interested, uh, that there. We looked at user plane protocols. Well, those have not changed. It's still over GDP, still the same way to diagnose the problem as before, still the same way to use Wireshark. So that's great. We go into RAN signaling. I showed you before it was S1AP. Um, they changed the name to be NGAP, which is Next Generation Application Protocol. And it looks pretty much the same. Still on top SCTP. So all those tools, all that stuff stays the same. Now, when we get to core signaling, we talked about diameter before. Diameter over SCTP for multi-homing, things like that. All that has changed to HTTP2. And on top of HTTP2, it is JSON. So when we look at a packet, you're going to see HTTP post and then the data underneath that. So just like if you're used to any HTTP information, you're going to see 200 OK. You're going to see a post to what looks like a URL, so on and so on. So when we look at 5G, we must have Wireshark 3.4 or greater. And there's a new thing added where you say HTTP over stream ID. 
So now we have to put in the stream ID that's being decoded in order to look at the JSON that's on top of HTTP2. It's a little cumbersome, but we're working on it. Um, so there's no wildcard here yet. And the, when you first look at it, you're only gonna see the string value. So key and value. This is a, this snapshot is actually from a development build so that you won't see this path and value yet. But this is the key and the value right here. So a context state activating. Um, this is an example of what I was talking about with the current Wireshark versions require you to filter like this. So if you're wanting to look at a key value pair, you have to put in the key and you have to put in the value. One of the problems is that what I'll say activating actually was in there, but belonged to a different key than up context state. Uh, it would still match, though it wasn't the intent. So in a recent build, development build, the key value was actually concatenated together to make the filtering a little, a, a lot better there. But you would use a regular string type of filter. The other thing is if you're used to um, HTTP, HTTP2 is not much different. You're going to see these, uh, what looks like API request. And that's exactly what it is. Uh, this NSF, SMF, refers to an API, which is specifically a service on a node, and we call it SMF. So if you're familiar with troubleshooting on uh, HTTP with JSON over the top, or even just API calls in general, that's pretty much what 5G looks like nowadays. That is the last slide that I have. Did we have any questions? Uh, great job, Mark. And uh, that's a lot of, a lot of great info. It was funny. Um, I didn't realize that's why it was called diameter. So quite, quite clever yeah. on, the, on, the word, on the word turn there. Uh, we did have uh, one question um, from Lav, and I'm not quite sure I understand it though. Uh, he asks, uh, can we use the TAC S and TAC, C, uh, TAC uh, Charlie parameters in the same command? And, you know, T Shark uses a TAC C and an edit cap uses a, a TAC S. So I, yeah. I wasn't sure what he meant by combine it. Um, yeah. Like that's what's doing for both slides. in T Shark or doing both in Edicap. I, I wasn't I wasn't sure on that. Um, so if you could ask again, that would actually be great, uh, uh, Lavin, uh, for that question. And I got a couple a uh, couple other other questions as well, but that one was my first, and I was quite sure. Uh, it was in one of the previous slides. <laughs> so there was a C, uh -huh. which was for edit, edit cap. Edit. C for edit cap. Which is account package. Uh, well, actually, right there. That, okay. that slide right there. You have both a TAC S and you have a TAC C. I think his question is, hey, can't you just do that all in one, uh, you know, in one command? I'm almost positive that's, that's what the question really mean, it, question means. You know, I, I haven't tried. I mean, here I'm either slicing it on a bit, <laughs> uh, a bit layer, or I'm counting the number of packets. Yeah. So he wants to slice and split at the same time. And, you know, I'll be honest, I've never tried that either. So I can't answer that question either. Um, yeah. Sorry. So let's try, uh, so you'll just have to experiment with that and try it and then let us know what we said. There you go. 
Um, <laughs> and actually, that would be something great um, to put into the Discord. We're in Zoom too, right? I think. Mm -hmm. um, so you would, you know, so that you could just put that into the, if you find the answer, just put it into the Zoom to uh, room. That would be great. Here we go. Exactly. Homework. Okay. So uh, let's see. Oh, okay, cool. Yes. All right. So actually, uh, those other three questions were uh, Lavin was um, being more, uh, giving us more explanation. So that was the only question, uh, Mark. Oh, okay. And, um, so and I didn't know the answer, and neither did you. So I, I felt better because yeah. I, I didn't know what it was. <laughs> I'm glad you Sometimes didn't. You just there. <laughs> never have to use that. <laughs> But that's, you know, yeah, it would be more efficient to do them both at the same time. I, I you know, my, my thought is yes, but I've never tried it, so. It's me, I specifically use it for different things. So like, I don't, I don't wanna concern myself with the payload at this point. Mm -hmm. So I'm mm -hmm. slicing at the, the byte layer. Mm -hmm. And then once I find it, maybe the PCAP's still too large. So I'm gonna cut it and then just find the information I want. and based on what I found in the TCP diagnosis after I sliced it. Right. Uh, and uh, Josh just mentioned, hey, maybe uh, pipe it to TACS and then into TACC. Well, see, there's no, there's no output here. It outputs directly to this file. Yeah, it almost out, um, um, output yeah. To, the, to the new file. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you wouldn't be able to pipe this command into this command because a pipe is taking the output from this command into this. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But yeah, try it. Yeah, try it. Give it a whirl. The worst it can do is like not work. There we go. Exactly. Um, <laughs> and uh, now uh, for, for everybody, um, I want you guys to, to notice uh, in, in the chat that uh, Angelo was kind enough to put the uh, link for the feedback for this uh, talk. Uh, that's the big way that you know we learn and, and get better yes. for, for next time. Uh, so be sure to fill that out. Um, and especially, you know, put in topics that, you know, hey, this was an amazing topic, but I would I would also like to see something on this topic. That yes. would be great as well. Um, and then, uh, and then David, I don't know if you saw the chat, Mark, but uh, David Perry says, thank you so much. And thank you, it was very thorough. And so we love that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah and if you have any questions or just want to talk about um, LTG or 5, 5G, I'm on Discord. My email's also in there. So um, I try to keep up on that. Cool. I'll say try. <laughs> and and I think uh, you said that you were going to put a copy of the presentation uh, in Discord, also in the Zoom to room. Yeah, I'll just drag that over awesome. right after this. Perfect. And then that way we can go ahead and uh, check out the files. Okay. Um, I discovered that if you do that, because uh, Mark was kind enough to send me a copy ahead of time, and I discovered that if you open it, uh, I, I don't have PowerPoint. I have Keynote. Right, I'm one of those weird mm -hmm. Mac people, and so uh, just one second, uh, uh, and I'll answer that question too. Um, it and it doesn't have the PCAPs, so no. I'm gonna have to like dig up a Windows computer. Um, and that's okay. I ha I still have some for just such occasions. So okay. I I thought that was funny. Um, let's see. So uh, uh, Tibo, you had asked, uh, will the recordings be available? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's awesome. Actually, Sherry just uh, added a bunch of info about that in, in Discord, I, I think in the general room, but it might have been one of the other rooms uh, where she uh, uh, let everybody know that um, all participants will go ahead and get a link to the presentations for uh, those that were recorded um, when, uh, like next week. Okay. And then you guys will be the only ones have links to the video, right? It'll be to the YouTube channel. It's going to be password protected. And she's going to give oh. the password. Um, but then as time marches on, you know, many months later, then they'll open it up to the rest of the world. Okay. You guys get exclusive rights for quite a while, which is All nice. Right. People should feel special. <laughs> so yeah, and she just posted that. I read that during lunch. So I don't, I don't know, Mark, if you saw that or not. I'm not. I'm used uh -huh. to retrospect being there. 
Right. Afterwards. Right. Exactly. Oh, you bet. Hey, no, no worries. Um, um, but yeah, I know it's like there's so much going on in Discord. You got to like keep up. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I can't keep up. <laughs> But yeah, if you if anybody has any topics they'd like to see next time, or or even just want to see to talk about now, hit me up on on um, email. I've used some of that feedback to include what I have now and actually remove some of the content I had before. So it helps a lot. I'd love to see a whole talk just on diameter, like troubleshooting diameter issues. I would love to see that. Oh. That's just me. <laughs> We're we'll gonna do a whole here. hour on that. That's <laughs> <I'd be> right. <laughs>